This is Robert Price of the Bakersfield, California, and you're watching TBC Media's coverage of the 2018 November general election. We are interviewing a series of candidates for various offices in Kern County and the southern San Joaquin Valley. And today I'm with Rudy Salas, the Democratic incumbent in the 32nd Assembly District. He's facing uh, Justin Mendez, a Republican, uh, in the November 6th election. Um, editor reporter John Cox is with us, and so is Jim Lawitz, Vice President and Executive Editor of TBC Media. Um, Welcome. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you joining us. Again. I'll give you, uh, you're getting to be a regular around here. Absolutely. Uh, I'll, I'll remind people a little bit here. The 32nd Assembly District covers all of Kings County and the Kern County communities of Arvin, Delano, Lamont, McFarland, Shafter, Wasco, and a substantial portion of Bakersfield. It's 69% Latino, and Democrats enjoy a 22% registration advantage over Republicans. Rudy Salas graduated from UCLA with degrees in history and political science. Prior to serving in the Assembly, he worked in the White House and at the uh, State Capitol as a legislative staffer, first elected uh, to the Bakersfield City Council as the first Latino member in 2012, when then Assemblyman David Valadeo announced that the same year he would not run for re-election, Rudy Salas won that seat. Um, tell us more about yourself, Rudy. That's it. Uh, well, that's a good little synopsis, but just born and raised here in the Central Valley, you know, grew up mostly in Bakersfield and Delano. Uh, parents all attended local schools. I attended local schools. Like any kid growing up here, you want to make money, you go out into the fields. My dad ran a, a crew out in the fields in the summer, and when somebody didn't show up, I took that person's job for the day. You know, thought I was rich because I made, you know, 40 bucks for the week. But, you know, it paid for things like school shoes and school supplies and a backpack and some clothes. Um, but, you know, my first official job, I always tell people, is actually working out uh, with a bunch of geologists for the oil field. So it was Exxon Mobil, now ERA. So did that, then went to, um, went to UCLA, always had two jobs in college. I did have three jobs for a stretch. Decided I had to go back down to two, and a full load was, was enough. So double majored, poli-sci, history. Um, then, you know, went to D.C., worked at the White House, did nothing political. It was actually all financial work. <laughs> um, back then, got to be there uh, during the, the historic 2000 election, one of the closest elections ever in history. Um, had a great time out there and then, you know, had some offers to stay in D.C., had some offers actually to work at some law firms in, in L.A., but decided to come back home and to make a difference and took a job at Cal State Bakersfield. Uh, getting kids into college, uh, worked with the Upward Bound program, the Migrant Scholars program, uh, the camp program, helped them uh, establish their summer program and run that and get kids into, into college and kind of on the right path. Uh, did that for a couple of years and then decided to get back into politics and, and uh, you know, Went up to Sacramento uh, for, for one of our local members, Senator Flores, worked with him, then uh, ran for city council in 10, and then now this is my sixth year, and it's so hard to believe, it goes by so quick, but my sixth year in the state assembly, and, and since that time, we've been able to do some good things um, throughout that time, and I remember when I first got elected, you know, everyone's like so happy, and my grandmother's like smiling, and, and then it was like, okay, now let's go out and let's do, and one of the first things that I remember um, us focusing on was, and we had no idea, but the governor had cut FFA at that time, the Future Farmers of America Career Tech Programs. And so we got, we found ourselves, you know, early on in a big fight with the governor <laughs> and uh, trying to restore this program. And I remember we had thousands of, of students from up and down the entire state up at the state capitol, and we're all chanting, you know, save FFA. And I mean, you can hear it inside the building because I got so many messages. Uh, for my colleagues inside saying, oh my God, was that you out there? And I was like, yeah, no, it's all those kids out there, all those students. Uh, but lo and behold, we were able to, to save that program, get them some money. Um, and now, you know, every time this issue comes up, every budget, you know, the governor's like, oh yeah, no, hands off, we're going to leave FFA alone. And we had a couple of, of uh, scares and stints from him over the years, but, you know, he's uh, always correct, of course, and made sure that we had the money in there for the kids. You know, so we've just been, you know, focusing on, like I said, I'm just a local guy just trying to do uh, what's good for the Valley and what's good for Valley families and try to focus on those issues where that affect our students or whether it's water, right, getting the $7 million to do uh, the Frank Canal. So we'll actually have some hydro help with the conveyance system out there, obviously Proposition 1 with the water bond, the safe drinking water. Um, you know, we actually had a community uh, a few weeks ago that actually their well went down. So we went out there and actually delivered That's, cases uh, of water. Uh, Stratford. Str Stratford, yeah. Yeah. So you know, there's still a lot of issues to continue to work on, but I've been, I've been happy with what we've been able to do and accomplish so far. Uh, but I guess we'll go into to all those issues as you want, Bob. 
Well, you're uh, so you're uh, you know your way around Sacramento now. Absolutely. Um, you're you're in a prime wage earning. Uh, territory here. I mean, you could walk away from this and probably go to Sacramento and work as a lobbyist, do any number of things. Uh, you're a, you know, kind of a proven commodity. Why continue in public service? Uh, to make a difference for folks back home, right? I mean, this is where my family uh, lives. This is where I grew up. This is, you know, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do uh, to make that difference for people. You know, people have always asked me all the time, like, hey, we got this job offer for you, or why don't you do this, or why don't you run for that? And I keep telling people, look, guys, it's not about the title. It's not about any of that stuff. It's about making a difference for back home. I mean, this is, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. This is why I get up every week and get on the road and head to the Capitol to help make a difference for families back home. Um, so, you know, there's always been those offers, but I always, tell, I always turn people down and say, look, this is one of the greatest jobs you can have on the face of the planet. There's no other job I know where you can change a couple of sentences and enact so much change for so many people, right? So whether it's bringing millions of dollars for those FFA kids or doing the million dollars we got for career tech at Bakersfield College or the money we're putting towards higher education or through K through 12 schools, like there's no other job where you can actually have that direct impact to affect so many, so many lives up and down the entire state, especially here in the Valley. So I feel, I feel uh, really happy about what we've been able to do. Um, you know, I remember about a year and a half ago, two years ago, when people were telling me their stories about Valley Fever, right, and the suffering that they were going through and uh, what it did to their family life, what it did to their work life. I mean, I was talking to one gentleman that said, you know what, I never, I'm not one of those people to, to say I have an illness. So he just kept working and working and he said, you know, they told me I got diagnosed, but I was working anyways and I didn't care and I was going to just prove them wrong until he started collapsing at work, right? And he said, look, you know, I fought with all my strength to, to work all the way through, but I just can't do it anymore. And so, you know, I promised, uh, I promised him and, and all the families that I would try to make Valley Fever a huge deal. And so this year, uh, we have uh, three pieces of legislation that have made it to the governor's desk on Valley Fever. Uh, two have been signed already by the governor. One we're awaiting for, which is, uh, uh, training the doctors to identify it early and to do uh, these kits for people up and down the entire state, but also getting the $8 million for Valley Fever, $3 million for research for, at the UCs for a, a vaccine or a cure, $3 million for the Valley Fever Institute over at Kern Medical, and then $2 million for a public awareness campaign because we know the earlier you catch it, the, d the big difference it makes in people's lives and their actual outcomes. And, uh, you know, I have lots of stories about that, too. And come to find out, even when I was starting to educate some of the folks up in Sacramento at the Capitol about this, I, I found out that some of them, you know, one of my colleagues actually had valley fever. And he was telling me his, his ordeal and how he was misdiagnosed. And he was in the fetal position and thought he was going to die. And uh, so, you know, we use that to guide uh, Assembly Bill 1790 and how we drafted that. And then also like other colleagues, like, oh, my grandfather had it, my cousin had it, you know, because we know here in, the, in, in Bakersfield and, and in Kern County and the Central Valley, we all know somebody that's been affected by valley fever, whether it's an aunt, an uncle, a brother, a cousin, a friend, a neighbor. Um, so, you know, I've been, been very uh, happy with the success we've been able to have and the awareness we've been able to do. So when you ask, like, why are you doing this? This is why, <laughs> this is to make that difference, you know, for free, for people here here at home. Yeah, uh, Jim has a question, I believe. Yeah, please. Or do you? No. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I got to ask you the gas tax question. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, our ro our roads are a mess all throughout California. Mm -hmm. And Rudy, you're a Democrat. I know. And <laughs> I know. I got I got punished for that. I got punished. So why did you oppose the tax? What were, what were your reasons? Yeah, so, you know, SB1, Senate Bill 1, uh, or the gas tax, you know, I, obviously I voted no against the gas tax, and I got punished for it. Um, I got removed from my chairmanship, a pretty prime chairmanship up in uh, the Capitol. It was a chairmanship that actually oversaw a lot of the licensing uh, across the entire state. So when you think about, you know, lawyers, and you think about doctors, and you think about um, even your barber, anybody that needs to be licensed by the state. Uh, but, you know, a lot of things weighed on my mind right before the eve of it. I had talked to the governor as well. Uh, but, you know, it basically comes down to, you know, we drive too far 
in the valley to, to do anything. We, we drive to drop off our kids at school. We drive to get groceries. We drive to work to and from. Um, and there was nothing in the proposal that helped address those issues, right? And when I brought, a, when I brought them up to leadership and to the administration, said, hey, this is a form of a regressive tax on folks. How can we help equalize this so that those that are suffering the most aren't hurt the most by this? You know, I was told, uh, I was told, well, just vote for it. And I just couldn't do that. I couldn't do that in good conscience to, to uh, the people I represent. I mean, the day after, actually, yeah, the day after I voted, I had an uh, elderly couple come up to me, give me a big hug and say, you know what, thank you for your vote. We're on a fixed income, and thank you for thinking of us. And for the months and months, and even uh, as recently as last week, people are still thanking me for that vote. Um, and so I, I feel like I did the right thing, even though it came at a, a political cost to me. But um, you know, it's not about politics. It's about representing people back home and doing what you think is right and standing up for what you think is right. And uh, every time somebody comes up and shakes my hand and tells me thank you or gives me a hug, you know, I, I feel good about the decision I made. Uh, meanwhile, the roads are still a mess. What, what, what are we going to do about that? Um, so. There was things in the proposal that I thought we could look at. You know, for instance, like the truck weight fees. Truck weight fees were always taken away from the transportation and used towards the general fund. Money that's generated from transportation should be going back to transportation. Those were some of the main focus points of what we should be doing for our roads moving forward. And so those are some of the things that, that I wanted to make sure that we explored uh, before we actually put a tax on the people, especially without the voters. Um, having the ability to vote on it. You know, now they have an opportunity in the repeal, but back then when we were discussing SB1, um, you know, it was being imposed on them as opposed to being asked. And I thought if maybe we had asked the voters, we'd have a more uh, balanced approach, especially for people that have to drive everywhere like we do here in the Central Valley where we don't have mass transit, we don't have a BART system, we don't have the metro. You know, we don't have a train running through the middle of the 99 like they do down in Pasadena on the 210. You know, there was nothing to account for those um, scenarios and those situations, especially uh, that we face here in the Central Valley. Yeah. John, got a question? Yeah, your uh, challenger, uh, Justin Mendez, was mm -hmm. sitting in that chair, I think it was yesterday, and he had said that despite the Democratic majority, supermajority, I think it is, in Sacramento, that relatively little has been done in the Central Valley for the poor, that there's a lot of focus on the cities, not so much in the Central Valley, and less on the poor. Um, how would you respond to an accusation like that? Yeah, actually, I would say look at the past budgets that we've had over the last six years. Everything that we've been doing to address uh, poverty, education, um, career technical education. Uh, since I first got there, we, I know we allocated one thing. What we fought for was the $15 million just for career tech, right? Because we know that not everybody in the Valley is actually going on to a four-year university. And so one of the ways that you can do that, and you can have a good middle class job, is becoming a welder, or becoming a plumber, having access in those bridgeways. And so you know, we did that. And even more, most recently in this last budget, we got the million dollars for Bakersfield College. And part of that million dollars is going to go towards industrial automation. Because one of the things we always heard from industry was, and especially ag, said, you know what? We need trained workers, especially as everything is becoming more mechanized. We need somebody to actually work on these computers and work on these big um, industrial machines. And so now uh, we will have a bachelor's of science in industrial automation, which I'm very proud of as well. Um, but the amount of funding for, for students has increased. It's over $11,000 per student now, which is the most that they've had, um, especially given since the downturn in 08, 09. Um, but in even this last year, one of the other things that we did was uh, $500 million towards homelessness, right? Because we know that people are suffering and the city of Bakersfield is actually going to get a good chunk because the top 11 cities um, all got an allocation and then what we're doing with all the other cities is matching uh, the funds that they put in. So there's been uh, different levels that we've been addressed. Now, can more be done? Absolutely. That's why I get up every day and still want to do this job. Going back to your, your question, Bob, like why do you want to do this? Because there's always more to be done. There's always something more we can work on, something that we can help uh, individuals with and what we can help families with. So, you know, you, you, you couple all that and, you know, I feel like we're making, we're making progress. Now, can more be done? Absolutely. 
and so that's uh, that's where our focus is, and that's you know where I've been focusing as well. Um, and even on the homeless piece, even when we got the public safety money, we got eight point seven million dollars uh, for Kings County. And I thought one of the things that you know me and the sheriff up there, we had put our heads together and said, okay, hey, let, how do we how do we tackle some of the issues that we have? Because we know the governor doesn't want to build any more jails or any more jail space. So how do we get at this? And so we came up with the idea of um, actually having services for the homeless. So we will build a shower and restrooms and lockers for the homeless. And they're centrally located downtown. So then you don't have the other issues of, you know, people relieving themselves in downtown or, um, you know, trying to find a place to shower out in like the park, for instance. And so we're actually going to have this homeless, this this homeless uh, showers and restrooms, and then the inmates are actually going to be the ones that help clean it and maintain it every day. So why the assembly, Rudy? Why the assembly? You're you're you've done six years in the assembly. Um, when you look at the pecking order, uh, people typically aspire to that next level of govern government. I can't even talk today. <laughs> um, what's your plan? For me, it's just doing stuff for back home. You know, it's just making a difference for families here. You know, people have always asked me, why don't you rent for this and why don't you do that? And, you know, you can make more money doing this. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's, you know, what job do you feel like you're actually going to have the most impact in? And right now I feel like that's in the assembly and that's with, you know, bringing home nearly $20 million directly to the Valley in last year's budget. So right? you don't that's not counting the, the big ticket items. Sure. So you don't think that you might have even more influence as a state senator or as a U.S. congressman or any one of those stepping stones in political office? Well, you know, I, I like where I'm at right now, and I feel like I have a good relationship with uh, leadership in the administration, even despite being punished for, for the gas tax. Uh, but I'm able to deliver. And at the end of the day, it's not about a title. It's about trying to do stuff for back home. Um, and I've always told people that, everyone that always tries to, well, run for Congress <coughs> and run for this, and why don't you, you know, go do this? And I'm like, you know, like I said, there's no other job where you can change a couple sentences and make <coughs> such a big difference for back home. And I feel like right now, for me, the assembly is a place where I'm able to do that. And you know, and I and I feel like I've proven that over um, over my six years. And and you know, when you go and so whether you're handing out water like to a community that doesn't have water, like out in Stratford, like you see the families and they appreciate that. Like those are the things that help drive you. Uh, those are the things that help drive me. And that's why, why the assembly? Because that's where I could feel like I could do the most good for the most amount of people. I think I'll be asking you that question in two years. <laughs> <laughs> John? John. Sure, I remember attending a, the, the Taft Oil Summit some years uh -huh. ago, and you were on stage sitting, I think, with um, Senator Fuller, uh -huh. um, talking about CEQA uh, oh, and how yeah. Mike Rubio had, had had started an effort to try to reform it, and, and that went nowhere. And then you and uh, Senator Fuller were talking about picking that up again. Correct. Um, which is certainly something that uh, we hear the business community talk about. Mm -hmm. Oil industry certainly has an interest in that. What happened? CEQA uh, modernization or CEQA reform. I mean, we're all for it, and we keep doing these CEQA uh, pieces of legislation that are, to me, piecemeal. Um, but, you know, we really need some... We really need some leadership from the governor's level to actually push that in through the entire legislative process. Like I said, we've been able to keep nibbling and nibbling and do things on, on the periphery, but in order to grab the bull by the horns, you know, if we had the governor fully engage and say, hey, this is something we're going to do and that we're going to enact, I think um, that's the way to go. I thought uh, at the time Senator Rubio was, was really close at doing that, um, but, you know, the makeup of the committee that he had to go through and the obstacles over in the Senate side that he had to overcome were, were just a bit a bit much. But that doesn't mean we give up the fight. You know, we're used to, to asking and not receiving and continuing to fight, fight until we get, <laughs> right? I mean, um, all of the budget asks that we've been able to do so far, um, you know, everyone's told me no, <laughs> first off. Like, where do you want this money to go? To the Valley. Oh, well, no, we need it for our high population areas in L.A. or San Francisco. I was like, no, 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 we need it for the valley. 
right? So just because people tell you no doesn't mean you stop. You continue to keep going. And so we'll continue to keep doing that, especially on the CEQA front. Uh, we passed a couple of CEQA uh, measures a couple of weeks ago um, that are sitting on the governor's desk. But, you know, I'm more than happy to, to fully engage back in CEQA. You know, one of the interesting uh, things about CEQA, though, when I was starting to delve, well, when I'm delving into it is, is the the business groups. I was finding this, everyone says they want reform and they, they want to do this, but then when you start asking like, okay, well, let's change this statute. Well, then one business group wouldn't like that and another business group would be, would be lukewarm on it, right? And so everybody says we want reform, but when you actually delve into the details, it's like, what does that actually look like? You know, I had proposed, um, Last, I think it was a year and a half ago, when they had the CEQA reform legislation for the Golden One Center up in Sacramento for the Sacramento Kings, right, had to meet the highest environmental standards, right, in order to be built. I said, okay, great. Let's call this the golden standard for CEQA then. As long as you meet these standards, then we won't have these uh, frivolous lawsuits. As long as you meet these environmental standards, then let's move forward and we'll call that uh, the benchmark for CEQA reform. And so, you know, I've been working on that with, uh, with several of my colleagues, the moderate Democrats that we call ourselves um, up in Sacramento, but we're trying to get that traction with the administration as well. But, you know, I'm like, hey, whatever the standard is, just set a bar, and that way we all know what the bar is. That way it's not changing on every single different project and for every d uh, different situation. So let's just set a bar. This is the environmental standard. Let's move forward. Let's call it. So if a business group does everything that they need to, they check all the boxes that they're environmentally responsible, then call that the bar and let's move forward. And, and that'll be the CEQA uh, reform, the CEQA legislation, I think, that everybody can live, live with moving forward. So we're, we're continuing to, to fight, John. <laughs> all right. All right. SB 100. Let's, yes. talk, let's talk about that. It, wants, it, it would uh, establish a... Um, a standard by 2060 that 100 percent of uh, our energy is from renewable sources there's an uh, interim step there i think by 2030 we have to be 60 percent um there i'm sure you can make some arguments that this is all good a good thing but it also sounds devastating to the kern county oil economy mm -hmm. uh oil-based economy here um it, first of all it is it is it necessary? Is it is it attainable? And what if it happens or anything close to that? What did, what does Kern County do? Yeah. So Senate Bill 100, I um, actually voted against because we had a lot of concerns about it about how it would be implemented, how you reach 100 uh, percent, what that means to our local economy moving forward. Um, I know when I asked uh, a bunch of folks and and the administration as well in the different departments, I said, how do we plan on getting to 100 percent? And they said, well, right now. Uh, we don't have a firm answer. And I was like, okay, wait, you want to set in a plan, but you don't even have a plan in place <laughs> to actually get there. And they said, well, you know, a lot of it, if you think about it, like we have a lot of solar on the grid, uh, but you can't use solar at all hours of the day. So until we crack the nut for battery and for storage, we don't know how we get there to the 100% renewable. Now, the other thing with SB 100 that people don't talk about is how you acquire those renewable energy sources. So there will be expensive ways to do that, uh, to get that to the 100%. So for instance, like using geothermal energy, right? More expensive uh, way to get energy, not the cheapest form. But if you're looking to get 100%, you might have to actually include that in your portfolio. So what does that mean for regular folks? It means your electricity bills will probably go up because they have to acquire this energy one way or another because it's a mandate to be at that 100%, right? And so because those issues weren't resolved and those issues weren't solved and nobody explained to me how you would get from A to B to C to D, um, I voted no on SB 100. Um, not to say that we don't want renewable and especially if it's cheap and it's free like solar, absolutely let's use as much as we can, but and until you can fix, they call it at uh, the Cal ISO, where they actually manage the energy grid, you know, the duck curve. And it's where you have so much energy at certain hours of the time, uh, certain hours of day, but you don't know how to manage that load because the demand's not there, right? And so one of the things that I've been looking at too, and I've uh, talked to folks is uh, perhaps using uh, an in-home display unit that could tell you the price of energy per kilowatt. So you can actually have real-time pricing in your house. So if you see like during, because you know, we've all growing up, 
you know, hey, you run the washer, you run the dishwasher after 8 o'clock, right? But with so much solar on the system, that's no longer true to be the cheapest power. It could be like at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock when there's a lot of solar on. But a lot of people don't know. So I've been trying to talk with the PUC about how do we give consumers the information they need inside their homes to actually make the best decisions they can. Because if it's cheaper to, to run your, to do a load of laundry at 4 o'clock in, in the afternoon or 5 o'clock, you know, I'm probably going to do that because I could see it's cheaper, but I could see it at home in a display unit. So uh, that's one of the projects I'm still working on right now. I got to ask you the question that I ask of, I think, every candidate, every uh, incumbent, every challenger. How do you keep the rural interests of the poor, underserved Southern San Joaquin Valley relevant in Sacramento, where urban interests dominate? Uh, you're a member of the majority party, but, uh, you know, a, a pretty conservative county here that's dealing with a relatively liberal state government. There's a, a lot of differences between Bakersfield and Sacramento. How, how do you look out for us? Um, so when I'm at the Capitol, and trying to explain to my urban, you know, counterparts, just trying to get them to understand, you know, look, we all care about our families, we all care, care about our kids, we all want them to be educated, we all want a good life for everyone in our community. So breaking down the barriers between urban and rural and just talking about family and talking about people. How do you make a difference in people's lives, right? And so I'll talk about, like this last legislative session, I'll talk about Valley Fever and say, let's talk about people and what this does to people's families and to their lives, right? And then I start giving them the numbers in LA County and the numbers in San Diego County, numbers in Sacramento County about people that are affected. Breaking down the barriers, getting people to understand what it means for people. Um, I've been able to have a lot of success in doing that with the relationships I've had, especially in the majority party in the Democratic Caucus, because they control they control the capital and they control the resources. So within, um, within, that, within that caucus, I'm able to break down those barriers and actually help deliver for back home. And like I said, I mean, we did um, even the Independent Living Center, one that was at $705,000 that we've been able to do for a couple of years now because of the funding and equity. Telling them, like, look, they tried to do a good thing initially. Uh, basically, they're getting screwed out of money now because of the way the system's set up and the feds have been cutting back. We don't want people to go unserved, right? It doesn't matter what community they're in. And so breaking down those barriers has been very uh, helpful and actually making a big difference for back home for folks. John, you got another question for Rudy? Well, yeah, something I've asked a, a, a few of the candidates so far is economic diversification. We're mm -hmm. still in Kern County largely dependent upon oil jobs, as we saw a lot of pain uh, since mid-2014. There's been some recovery. Uh, and, and agriculture. Um, how do we move forward with a diversification of Kern County's economy? Yeah, I think it uh, starts with the career tech. I think that's going to help. Um, offering more positions in healthcare, because um, I know we've been working with the nursing programs and putting more money towards uh, CSUs to graduating more nurses and actually all of the health applied sciences. Uh, so phlebotomists, uh, nurse practitioners, uh, uh, PAs, I mean, all the way up and down the entire gamut. But it's giving people options to grow different economies. Um, I know last, I think it was last year, man, my time kind of <laughs> goes in and out, but I think, pretty sure it was last year or maybe even earlier this year, but, you know, Google did uh, two coding classes up and down the entire state. We were able to get Google to come here to our downtown school in Bakersfield because I reached out to them, I had a relationship with them, and said, hey, this is something that we need to do. So if it's, you know, Silicon Valley doesn't need to happen in Silicon Valley. So we were able to get that coding class for the, for the students here to just start learning, and hopefully it piques one of their interests to actually continue to keep doing uh, those things. So I think it's just bringing um, a lot of different sectors to our community here, and then trying to grow them from there. Um, and then, you know, the resources always helps. <laughs> Well, sounds good, uh, Rudy Sellis, uh, re-election uh, on your mind in the assembly. Uh, give us the closing statement. Sell, sell us the car. Talk to the voter. I always appreciate your support. Um, obviously, just a Central Valley kid, just trying to make a difference for folks back home. Um, you know, grew up here. My family lives here. Uh, really, at the end of the day, it's really about trying to make a difference and how do we make our community a better one. And I think we do that. Um, I think we do that by coming together. You know, I think together we're stronger, 
together. I always like to say we're Valley Strong. Um, but it's really about making a difference, and I want to continue to make that difference and continue to fight for you guys. Um, really would appreciate your support to go back and and help make that difference. I hope my my record over the last six years speaks for itself in terms of the amount of uh, not only money and resources we've been able to bring, but just the awareness to issues and helping make a difference in in every um, in every in every family's life. Hopefully, you know we've been working on water, we've been working on public safety, we've been working on jobs and career tech. Uh, we do. We host senior scam events. We every year, people are like, "Why do you do all these events?" It's like because we want to make a difference for folks. Uh, even fun events like our trunk or treat events for Halloween. Um, you know, the Google coding class, bringing Google in where they didn't go to any other part of the state except one other place. You know, we're the second place that they've came to. Um, you know, it's just about making that difference for folks back home, and uh, I would appreciate your support to continue to do that, to do that good work. All right, Rudy Sells running for re-election in the 32nd Assembly District. Thank you, Rudy. Right. Appreciate it. Robert Price with the Bakersfield Californian here. Uh, this is uh, TBC Media's coverage of the uh, 2018 uh, general election. Uh, we have a whole bunch of stuff on bakersfield.com, other videos, other candidates, other races. Thanks for watching this one.